Yep. All right. Yep. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the 14th Annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium at the State University. We're delighted to have you all here. It's been a lot of preparation over the past year. We had a lot of fun with this, and I think we're going to have a great event. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, welcome you as an alumnus of this institution, which just recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. <laughs> and on behalf of the institution, I'd like to invite Maureen Moore, Vice President for University Relations, to be here. Maureen? University President Dr. Tom Mitzel was unable to be here this evening, but he sends his greetings. He regrets missing this event and the opportunity to meet and visit with all of you. This annual symposium marks the 14th year that Dickinson State University has participated in the Roosevelt Arena. The city of Dickinson has been a wonderful sponsor of this event for a number of years, and we are grateful for their continued support. Thank you to the city of Dickinson. A Smithsonian Institute tour in Western North Dakota this coming week. Sure Wendy Ross, Superintendent of the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Hey, Valerie Naylor, former Superintendent of the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Claudia Berg, Director of the State Historical Society of North Dakota and the North Dakota Heritage Center and State Museum. Claudia. Jeremy Johnston, Curator of the Buffalo Bill Museum and Managing Editor of the Papers of William F. Cody. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Pitts, Board Member of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library Foundation. Also among our participants tonight, we are pleased to welcome the Rhodes Scholars and their host, Mar Marilyn Hovland. If you're not aware, we are live streaming this event, so I wanna say hello to our participants online. Thank you for joining us tonight. We welcome all of these guests and to all of you. We hope that your time here at Dickinson State and in Western North Dakota is one that you will remember and cherish forever. Thank you and welcome. To reintroduce, to introduce our speakers and tonight's competition, uh, I welcome Sharon back to the podium. Sharon. So, a hundred years since Theodore Roosevelt died, January 6th, 1919. Um, when we started thinking about this symposium, you can't but talk about his legacy. Everybody, everyone is talking about his legacy this year. But how do you cover that in two days? <laughs> about 48 hours that we're all going to be together, most of us. And so um, my colleague, Clay Jenkinson primarily, but others as well, had the idea to introduce this couple of days together with um, this cartoon off that we're going to execute this evening. The Roosevelt cartoons are rich and varied, and they represent so many aspects of Roosevelt's legacy, and so they will help us tonight to introduce so many themes that we'll be drawing out in deeper discussions throughout the rest of our time. Uh, to help us this evening, we are so delighted. It has been my privilege to work with Clay Jenkinson for the past uh, 14 years on this effort with the Theodore Roosevelt Center here at Dickinson State. Um, Clay moved back to North Dakota about the same time I came here, and, and we both sort of fell into this and have had a wonderful ride, and, and it's so enjoyable. Um, the thing I'd like you to know about Clay, obviously he's an eminent historian. Uh, he's an interpreter of many historical characters, primarily Thomas Jefferson, Meriwether Lewis, 
and others in addition to Theodore Roosevelt. But more than anything else, what I appreciate about Clay is he's a lover of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And he's taught me to love my home even more. Mm -hmm. And I hope you experience that over the time you have with him. Cool? And yeah. his competitor, <laughs> his partner in crime this evening, um, we, when you think about introducing Roosevelt's legacy through cartoons, we couldn't have an invited anyone else but Rick Marshall to join us. He has a wonderful biography of Theodore Roosevelt, which is written and illustrated with vintage cartoons, more than 250 vintage cartoons. That biography will be available. If you don't yet have a copy, uh, we'll make that available to you here. Uh, he's um, just done so much in this arena. And again, there's no one better who could execute this cartoon off uh, with Clay this evening. So please help me welcome Clay Jenkinson and Rick Marshall. Thanks, Sharon's going to stay up here for a moment. Um, let me say hello to all of you. I'm so glad to be here. What a huge and wonderful um, audience tonight. This is uh, absolutely tremendous. Um, I was a little disappointed to hear Rick say they're only here because it's raining outside and there's nothing else to do. Yeah, uh, I wondered, but I wondered. One, one of the reasons. Um, I, I want to just take a moment here, uh, first of all, to, um, to think about my mother for a moment. Some of you knew my mother, Mill Jenkinson. Uh, she was an absolutely um, extraordinary human being. Uh, she came here every year, sat in the back, heckled. Um, <laughs> she'd go through the program. She'd say, oh, I don't think I want to see that. And I'm uh, not, not sure about that one. And then afterwards, she, at home, she'd give me these critiques, mostly of me. Um, but I miss her, and I, and, I, and I think of her every day, but I think of her particularly um, at these events. And uh, the second thing I want to say is how much I appreciated what Sharon just said about my love of North Dakota. Um, the, uh, thank you. And if I could make you love North Dakota more, that's really something, because Sharon is um, from southwestern North Dakota, grew up in rural life, large family. Um, the North Dakota we sort of remember, um, where people had cattle and sometimes hogs and gardens and some people even hauled water and during the harvest, you know the harvest when the whole family was on high alert and my grandmother used to make meal to take out to my grandfather who was on the combine and he wouldn't wouldn't take a break but we would go out to the field in a red IH pickup with, with what she called dinner and, and it was in a basket uh, with a thermos that had the plaid Thing around it, you remember those in the plastic red cover that, with the handle, and and he would then run a couple of extra rounds just to mess with us and wouldn't stop, and he'd finally stop, and he'd be grimy because he never had a tractor with a cab, uh, and, and he wouldn't sleep during that period because he was concerned about rain or hail or delay. Uh, it's an exciting time, and and that rural life that Sharon embodies and brings to everything that she does. And I so deeply appreciate it. So I'm writing a new book about North Dakota. And I'm about two thirds of the way through. And the only reason I bring it up is that I want your help. And I actually have a survey that I'd like anyone who wants, stick around, I'll give you one afterwards, a number of questions about North Dakota. Who we are, who we were, where we're headed. Do you like where we're headed? What does a post-agrarian North Dakota look like? Um, so the working title is not the actual title, but it's called Who Are We Now? And if you can help me, I'll get this survey and, and respond to it, and I'll be thrilled because I observe North Dakota every single day, but of course I only see through my own eyes. And I'd love to see it through yours. And, and the best decision that the TR Center ever made was hiring uh, Sharon Kilzer to be the project manager. So thank you, Sharon. Um, I want to thank the Rhodes Scholars for coming again. We so appreciate that. Um, and to the students, I see so many students from Dickinson State University here tonight. That's a very special thing, and we, we couldn't be um, um, more gratified that you're here. I hope you come tomorrow to the extent that you can, uh, because we have a really remarkable day planned. So now let's, let's get to it. As, as Sharon said, Theodore Roosevelt died on January 6th, 1919, 60 years old. It's 100 years ago. 
And it was inevitable that this symposium would be about his legacy. We've done 13 others. We've done Roosevelt and Women, Roosevelt and Conservation, Roosevelt and World War I, Roosevelt the Naturalist, Roosevelt and Family, and so on. And so each year we try to pick an appropriate theme. This year it was inevitable that we talk legacy, and we thought that this cartoon discussion would really bring that along. And one thing I asked Sharon to do before Rick and I get started is to nominate her favorite Theodore Roosevelt cartoon and explain why it is so. So Sharon, if you would change the PowerPoint, or you have it up now. Yep. So uh, cue up your cartoon. Um, can you all see? And tell us why you love this cartoon. Okay, so this is called Stop, Look, Listen. Can you guess when this was? <laughs> Has to be 1912, right? Mm -hmm. President Taft, with all his heft, is sitting on the White House. And Theodore Roosevelt is coming barreling along with all the energy and vitality that he represents. And I love this because I can't imagine how the cartoonist, oh, I forgot to mention, <laughs> Rick, Rick Marshall is a car political cartoonist himself. <laughs> So he can appreciate this, um, to represent that energy with such power in a single image. Um, and what inspires me the most about Theodore Roosevelt, 100 years after he's gone, is, is that vitality with, with, with which he lived. And I hope that I live with greater vitality because I have the privilege of working on Roosevelt. Um, so this is my nomination, and, and right now I'll just make the case that, that I think my cartoon trumps all of theirs, and you should vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> so here, thank you, Sharon. Here's how the voting is going to work. We're going to do four cartoons, and we'll ask you to we'll toggle back through them and ask you to indicate by applause which one of those four you like best. Very unscientific. It probably won't work. Uh, but, but we want to get a sense from you of what you like. Um, and believe me, nobody's feelings can be hurt if you vote for Sharon. That just makes the whole pointless thing uh, that we've done tonight even more interesting. But, but Rick, before we move on, first of all, of Rick Marshall, when you read his biography, 70 books you have written, 70 books. Theodore Roosevelt wrote between 35 and 40, depending on how you count. Yeah. You've written almost double what that prolific writer wrote. Some people say that your greatest book is Bully, the book that we'll be selling afterwards. There's a book signing right afterwards. I'm not even sure that that's true. You've written about musicians. You've written Christian apologetics. You've written children's books. I won't even ask you to try to describe all of that, but you've written 70 books, and you have one advantage over Roosevelt. You've written one about him, although <laughs> it could be said every one of his books was about him. There we go. Uh, he right. wrote a, a book called The Rough Riders in 1898, and uh, a sarcastic um, Humorous said that the only thing that was wrong with the book is the title. It should have been called Alone in Cuba. Alone in Cuba. So Roosevelt knew how to write about himself. In fact, someone who uh, did a book review of his book, Oliver Cromwell, said it should, the subtitle should be how Oliver Cromwell would have been governor of New York if things had <laughs> worked out a little different. So uh, amazing, your, your productivity. And of course, you're not done yet. Can you say anything about Sharon's cartoon, either to degrade it or to improve it? No, it's not a bad choice. One thing about Roosevelt, who was all things to all people and so multifaceted, it's hard to say what quality of his was superior to others. Um, and we were talking at dinner about how conservationists, how liberals and conservatives can both claim Roosevelt and they'd both be right, and there are so many issues. So it is with the cartoons. They all have a, uh, a touch of truth and they may be kidding Roosevelt. Now this is by Joseph Kepler Jr. who inherited Puck Magazine from his father. And he was a friend of Roosevelt. He was interested in Indian affairs. We'll talk about this. Uh, Roosevelt relied on him. But it was a democratic magazine. So there were pro-Roosevelt cartoons reluctantly and anti-Roosevelt cartoons when his backers got angry. <laughs> but um, he was a great cartoonist and he was one of the first cartoonists to break the mold of cartoons that had like two dozen labels explaining who they were. So this is brilliant in part for simplicity. So I mean, the, the jowls and the staidness of Taft yeah. and the dynamism of Roosevelt is, is working. It was a double truck cartoon yeah. illustration. So these were lavishly printed, weren't they? That's right. Sometimes who, turned this? into posters. What's this? 
Uh, I have this issue, but I don't remember. It's a person. I don't remember. I don't know. I can't right, see. Somebody, some poor person is looking at these two giants uh, in dismay. Oh, here it is. Um, professor. Oh, it's someone who must have made a, a speech about it during the campaign. And I don't remember. I have the issue, but I don't remember if it was during the primaries or when they were two-thirds of the candidates in the election. But so we all think of a four by six inch cartoon or even smaller in a newspaper. How wide would this have been, uh, Rick? Uh, eight to 16 inches. So think of that, these lavish, and new technologies were making this possible. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. So this is one we did not choose, which seems a little silly since this is maybe the most famous of all Roosevelt cartoons. Give yeah. us a quick background on this. Okay, in a way it's one of the most famous cartoons and consequential cartoons by Roosevelt. He went on a bear hunting trip to Louisiana and Mississippi, and it was written about that he had an unsuccessful day, didn't bag a bear, and that well-meaning guides brought a sick, and the stories diverge, a cub or an elderly bear, uh, roped it and brought it to Roosevelt so he could shoot it and have a trophy. Roosevelt said, no thanks. This is Clifford Berryman was the cartoonist, the Washington Star. He was originally with the Washington Post. And he did the category of cartoons that were really illustrated news events. He wasn't trying to make a point to persuade people. That was his genre. So he did this, drawing the line of Mississippi. And it became a national sensation. It was reprinted widely. He was not a great caricaturist. He did realistic faces on uh, cartoon bodies, but it was reprinted like crazy. It was reprinted, redrawn many times because he realized he could have done better. But because of this cartoon, two things happened. He adopted the bear as his cartoon mascot into the 50s. And we'll see a little of that later. We will see that later, excuse me. And the other thing that happened was this was so popular that a toy maker in Brooklyn, New York, made a stuffed toy for kids based on this, and it took off. And then the Steiff company in Germany made one and sold it worldwide. And that's how the teddy bear was born. So kids still have teddy bears, but it all came from this cartoon. And, and you could say of this, not, not, not to spend too much time on it, but that drawing the line in Mississippi, this was a time when there was still widespread lynching in the South and sometimes in the North. So this cartoon has a number of potential layers here. Subtexts. Roosevelt would, he said, unhand that bear. I won't, I, it's not sport to kill a bear that you've already tied to a tree. But he's also talking, the Berryman is also hinting at lynching. And there's also a boundary dispute between Louisiana and Mississippi at That's the right. time. So it's a complex piece of work. All right, so this is another one that we chose together. Yeah. Um, this is one of my very favorites, and I know yours too. Explain, this Leslie's Weekly was sort of the, Life magazine of its time, heavily time, illustrated. Time Under Week, Harper's Weekly, Leslie's Week. So yeah. go ahead. Well, um, Harper's Weekly at this time was generally a Democratic news magazine, weekly, and Leslie's was a Republican. Uh, news of the Week, a lot of photographs and cartoons, mostly photographs. And if I can, what's remarkable about this is not really a cartoon, it's a photograph, but the Torn Paper is a cartoon by uh, Emil Flory, who eventually worked for Disney when he was an old man. Um, what's remarkable about this cartoon is that it was printed, if you can see the date, it was printed for release a couple days before the presidential election in 1916. So Roosevelt's been out of office for seven years. He's been out of office for seven years. He was not a candidate. It would have been Wilson or Hughes. It turned out it took a couple weeks to sort out the electoral votes. But to me, it's remarkable that a national magazine would have a cover with Theodore Roosevelt bursting into public consciousness. Bursting through the paper. Through the, news, for, through the magazine. Uh, when he was not a candidate, they could have had Wilson or Hughes or both of them. I mean, the 100 things they could have done. But it's really a statement through a cartoon mode that Roosevelt was the figure in the national debates. By implication, he would dominate for the next four years and maybe be the candidate again. Uh, 
in a way, it was a diss job on Wilson and Hughes, like ignoring them, and Roosevelt was, was it. So it's another example, as you said, that cartoons can work on several levels. This says a lot of things by not saying a lot of things. And the man who's been out of office it. for almost two administrations is still the most dominant political figure right. in the United States. This would be a little bit like, say, Time Magazine today, having during the debates now, having a George W. Bush figure bursting through the cover. Yeah. That's how huge a, a person Roosevelt was, that he, that he couldn't be repressed. And even more than that, and I'll touch on this tomorrow on the war uh, issue, but in 1914, 15, and early 16, he was at the lowest point of his career. He was on the outs with the public. He favored preparedness. The public was pretty pacifistic. Uh, the Republicans wouldn't nominate him. He was on the outs, but through the months in 1916, he reestablished his, his dominance of the debates. Sharon, can everyone hear? Is it, we have enough volume? Okay, good. One, just one more thing about this, Rick. Uh, many of the cartoons we're going to show, or many of the cartoons that we're displaying around um, this room and in the hallways, show a kind of a menacing, aggressive, even angry Roosevelt. Nothing angry here. This is just his full high spirits. Clay, that's a great point, because we think of Roosevelt today this way, smiling and beaming. Yes, there were photos of that. But if you look at most of the photos, the portraits, the news pictures, Roosevelt was pretty stern, or at least dignified. He took pride in that. He didn't like to be filmed in newsreels, because he thought he was like a marionette. He didn't want to perform for the public. So if you knew him just by his photographs, except for a few like this, you'd think he was a pretty serious guy. But we know him through the cartoons, where he was, he didn't, he didn't gesture, he gesticulated, and he didn't walk, he ran, and uh, he didn't smile. He, you could hear him in the next county laughing. So. All right, now this is another one that, we, I mean, I suppose you're wondering, well, we get to the competition. You and I <laughs> chose this one as sort of outside of the realm, and I think Michael Cullinan is going to talk a good deal about it tomorrow. So just Great. quickly glance at it. Well, very quickly, it's by Jay Norwood Darling, who's, uh, pen name was Ding. And um, should I go through the backstory very quick? Yes. He, um, Ding, who was a friend of Roosevelt's and designed for years the duck stamps. Uh, he was a conservationist like Roosevelt and a hunter like Roosevelt. And when he got word that Roosevelt died, he had very little time, uh, deadline time, for a cartoon for the paper, Des Moines Register. <laughs> So he stole from himself. Two years earlier, he had drawn a cartoon about Buffalo Bill's death. And he had a ghostly Buffalo Bill going into the mountains and kids waving goodbye. Uh, so he thought, he just took that idea. He made a very simple cartoon compared to his usual. It's a very simple. Thinking the next morning he'd do one for the ages. Well, he didn't have time because it was distributed nationally overnight. And it became a sensation. And he never did a substitute for this. It became uh, famous. It was turned into posters. It was on walls of schoolrooms. And he did etchings, signed etchings. So this is one of the classic Roosevelt images. We and have. for those of you who are going with us on Saturday on the road trip on oh, the Enchanted right. Highway, uh, the second to last of the sculptures is a version of this, which is why we chose the Enchanted Highway as the Saturday part of the, the Saturday right. excursion. Great. What I find so interesting about this, Rick, is that um, Roosevelt ceased to be a cowboy in around 1888. This is 1919, and he's still so heavily thought of in that cowboy mythology that this is a, a, a useful farewell tribute to him decades after that part of his life had actually ended. That's right. He never really discouraged that persona. All right, so this is your, now we're in the competition. Uh, that was just preliminary. Uh, here you go. This is your, now we said 10, but you insisted on 12. So, uh, so here's your number 12. Tell us why you chose this cartoon. And this cartoon, Harper's Weekly, as I said, was a Democrat uh, paper. Uh, the cartoonist is Kemble, E.W. Kemble, who had been chosen from obscurity when he was a young cartoonist by Mark Twain to illustrate Huckleberry Finn, and he never looked back. And he was a good cartoonist when he had someone supply good ideas. Otherwise, he was a pen for hire. Uh, but this cartoon in 1912. 
the Bull Moose campaign. Uh, during the Bull Moose campaign, uh, gives Roosevelt grief, even though it's a Democrat paper. Wilson was against women's suffrage. Taft was against women's suffrage. Edith was against women's suffrage. Even Roosevelt's wife was against, wife was against uh, indifferent to it. Um, so the implication here is that he was pandering and uh, an opportunist. opportunist, phony, fishing for votes, but if women couldn't vote, how could it? Anyway, just taking a cheap shot at Roosevelt. But it's something we need to remember, that he took those stands because he believed in them, and he didn't usually, sometimes, didn't usually test the wind before he took a stand. And indeed, Jane Addams seconded him at the... Uh, Progressive Convention and everything. And his, his Harvard senior thesis is about the rights of women. Thank you. That's he right. has some credentials yeah. as an early kind of quasi-feminist, but then yeah. there are times when he was disappointing to the women's movement, too. Yeah, yeah. But you like this yeah, why? Yeah. Well, Kemble did have a way, I mean, I gave him a left-handed compliment there, but um, there could have been a hundred ways to draw Roosevelt. Okay, this is a little insulting, what? but that face, there's no... Uh, mistaking that face. Now, it wasn't Campbell's invention, and frankly, Roosevelt invited caricatures because he smiled more broadly than he wanted. I suppose he did when he asked someone to pass the salt at dinner or something. But that, that face, that image, as a cartoon, it's a great cartoon. You have his face, you have the woman's coat, you have the feather. Your friend, what is that uh, from your friend? Does it say from TR? Your friend TR. Um, but you also have him with riding spurs. So he was just taking every cheap shot he could at Roosevelt. Why and does it look like blackface? What, what's, what's, is that part of the printing? No Why reason. Does it? No, it's just the way he shaded. He just shaded. That's all. Yeah, it's the only reason. But it's a grotesque image of Roosevelt. Yeah, he didn't mean to be complimentary. Kemble, by the way, one of his, okay, Huckleberry Finn, he did Southern Rural Subjects, but also he did a lot of cartoons and books about rural blacks. In the day, they were seen as complimentary and sympathetic. Today, not so much. Now, not so much. But no, that's no reference here. Uh, so re keep in mind, you're going to be asked to decide how much you like that one. Here's my first, my number 12. I just love this because it's about Roosevelt on safari. Um, and all the animals of Africa are climbing up in trees to try to escape his, <laughs> the mighty hunter's rifles. Um, it's, it's playful, it's appreciative. It's not meant to be a savage attack on Roosevelt the no. hunter. Um, it's appreciative, and he has this uh, delightful chimpanzee or, or ape bringing the ladder. Everyone's fleeing from, mm -hmm. from Roosevelt. It's a very playful cartoon. I love that, it's very well executed. But, but I, we're talking about legacy, and so you just mentioned how Images of African Americans in cartoons of his time would probably not be regarded as acceptable or politically correct in ours. Attitudes towards hunting have changed too, and so today Roosevelt's life as a big game hunter is less well appreciated and less well understood perhaps than it was then. There were people in his time who, th who felt that he over hunted, and he was a little sensitive to that, especially as time went on. So he probably would, I think, wouldn't you say, Rick, would have appreciated this, uh, this cartoon? I think the cartoon is by Homer Davenport, isn't Homer, it? Homer Davenport. What's he would have loved it. He was a friend of Davenport. <clears throat> and I think we'll see another cartoon or two about which it is said, rumored, I think, that Edith kept a scrapbook. Of Davenport? Uh, no, of a lot of Roosevelt cartoons, okay. some of which were not complimentary. And that... Uh, she not only enjoyed going through the scrapbook and chuckling, but at times that she thought Theodore needed to come down a peg or two in the household, she would it's take out the scrapbook. A little of a bad press. Come, children, look at you. Um, but very quickly, one thing about Davenport, he drew for William Randolph Hearst from the 1890s to 1904, savage anti-Roosevelt cartoons. Then he switched to the New York Mail and drew pro-Roosevelt cartoons until about 1911, when he went back to work for Hearst. But you'll see some of his iconic Roosevelt cartoons. So let's just pause there for a moment. I, I don't want to stop long, but mm. you're saying that this cartoonist changed his, uh, his attitude towards Roosevelt depending upon who had hired him and what sort of newspaper he was in. Can you talk a little bit about the complexity of cartooning? Yeah, well, a lot of car some cartoonists did that, and they could be seen as hired guns. Um, 
Art Young, a socialist cartoonist, once drew a cartoon of a bordello in which all the women were really men who were newspaper men and cartoonists, treating them as hired guns and, and whores, just uh, drawing for the paper that would pay them the most. It was often true. Uh, with Davenport, there was an extra factor, and that is when he switched to the New York Mail, a much smaller paper, um, he did it because he, uh, he came around to admire Roosevelt, and he couldn't take any more the orders from William Randolph Hearst. And if, in fact, he drew the 1904 official Republican cartoon uh, Uncle Sam endorsing Roosevelt. There's an extra layer here is that Homer Davenport, who would come from um, Silverton, Oregon, loved white Arabian horses and bred them and tried to import them and had trouble doing so. And it was Roosevelt. They'd become friends at that time. Roosevelt eased, maybe suspended the uh, tariffs or something, I don't know. But he, uh, he eased uh, the restrictions, so Davenport was able to import dozens of Arabian stallions, magnificent horses. So they, it's sort of like John L. Sullivan, the boxer who had been a drunk, and Roosevelt helped them uh, straighten out. Davenport became a fierce admirer of Roosevelt. Then he went back to the other side. He did only in the months before he died, okay. and it was with the understanding that Hearst was not going to ask him to. Uh, Hearst was already disenchanted, getting disenchanted with Bryan and the Democrats, so that was easy, an easy switch to make. But Davenport said, I will not draw an anti-Roosevelt cartoon. I have more questions to ask about this, but let me go on for the moment. This is yours. This is a great cartoon. Yeah. Uh, tell us about it. This became the dust jacket of my book, uh, Bully. Um, Which you can buy afterwards, and you'll sign. I uh, might sign. Um, and I'll draw a caricature of you if you're... Wow. <laughs> Even better. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Roosevelt came back from Africa and Europe uh, after Taft had been elected. He wanted to get out of Taft's way, but also he had been planning these trips for a long time. Uh, came back and said publicly he wanted to stay out of politics for a while. We know that was constitutionally impossible. I mean, his own constitution. Um, and in 1910, he was drawn back into politics by some really some schemers around President Taft. And they wanted Roosevelt to be temporary chairman of the Republican State Convention in New York State in 1910, midterms, as an honorary job, uh, take the seat for the, well, he said, okay, reluctantly, he said, okay. In the meantime, the same people recruited Vice President Sherman, Taft's Vice President, a reactionary, to be that chairman. It was not fair. They meant to box Roosevelt out. So if Roosevelt withdrew, he would have looked like a coward, not contesting that seat, honorary, but still. Or he could have been a bully challenging the administration and fought for it. So how many people think Roosevelt fought for it? <laughs> well, he did. And the opponents said at crunch time, they said, we will beat Roosevelt to a frazzle. That was the public statement, the press release. They did. Well, he beat the Republicans to a frazzle. He dominated the convention. And what I love about this cartoon, it, what it says, it illustrates the um, event. It tells us how Roosevelt usually came out in fights with the Republican establishment his whole career. Um, we don't need labels. We know who it is, GOP. Frankly, that's um, extra there. But um, what I love the most about it, W.A. Carson, who's kind of lost to history, drew this. Um, but he was an excellent caricaturist. But didn't he catch the vitality of Roosevelt? You know, he came to be called a happy warrior. And does this catch that? So that's... Plus, that's he's just been on safari where he killed an awful lot of things. Here he's, <laughs> here right. he's dragging a live elephant. There you go. He's taken it captive. He's taken the party captive, but he hasn't put it out of its misery here. Excellent point. Yeah, it's not a trophy head. It's, it's, and he's yeah. as gleeful as a man can be here. Isn't that great? Yeah. Um, so here's my number 
2. Um, this, is a, this is a darker cartoon, but I love it. This is, it says, I believe in giving every man a square deal. Roosevelt was famous for his belief that every human being, irrespective of, of their station in life, deserved a square deal, that, the, that if the dealer is dealing the cards right, then people will accept the fact that maybe their life is not spectacular, but if the dealer is corrupt and pulling cards from under his sleeve, that that's, that's what people object to, and that's what leads to rebellion and revolution. So he's famous for the square deal, and here's Taft, the staid, cautious, responsible, um, dignified William Howard Taft coming into the presidency, and Roosevelt is a terrorist, and here's his almost square deal, <laughs> and he's going to pop Taft, he's going to mug yeah. Taft to steal the nomination away from him here in 1912. And contrast the, the face of this Roosevelt with the face of this Roosevelt. Great. Look at the anger, the mean-spiritedness, the, the vicious and grotesque caricature here, Rick. It's, a, it's an excellent cartoon. Someone who obviously was offended by Roosevelt's insurgency in 1912. What can you tell us? It's Kemble again, isn't it? Kemble again. Um, he often drew even crazier than this, but he would often draw Roosevelt with two capital letter I's in his glasses. Um, <laughs> Meaning I, 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 I. Yeah, ego, yeah. yeah. Um, but to show you how cartoonist news break here, not always fair. But Harper's Weekly was Republican mag uh, Democrat magazine. They never gave Taft a fair, a square deal or a fair shake. And yet here they picture him as the most dignified, innocent fellow in the world. So it's a cheap shot, but a lot of political cartoons are, I suppose. And it be. says to the Republican convention, interesting, Roosevelt has pulled the brick out from under the edifice here. Yeah. He's, a, he's a desperate political opportunist in well, this Well, he cartoon. had an edifice complex from what I hear. All right, so let's go back. Now it's time to vote number one. So this is, I know this is kind of nutty. Um, so the first cartoon was... Um, Roosevelt and the women's movement. How many think that's the best of these four? <laughs> Sorry, Rick. How about this one? Roosevelt and, hey. I, I, I sense a victory there. Uh, how about this one? Okay. About even with the last one, I think. <laughs> and how about this one? All right. So, All right. so far, you chose well for your book. Okay, yeah, the check's in the mail, folks, by the way. So. And, and we like this one, I think, because it's just so exuberant, and it, and it absolutely nails Roosevelt at his most delighted, exuberant, forward-leaning, etc. So that's a good start. All right, let's move on. This is your number 10, uh, My Boy. Tell us about it. Yeah, I didn't realize between the two of us we chose so many Kembles. It's like we're the Kemble Soup Kids or something, right? Um, wow. Thank you. Um, really good. But this is another, okay, so he'd come back, just come back from a year plus in Africa and Europe, and America was frankly starved for Roosevelt. He ordered that no press follow him on safari, and okay, through Europe he went, but otherwise this man who had dominated the news for a decade and more was absent. So. Everyone was looking back, looking forward to Roosevelt's return, including Harper's Weekly, which was advocating the party that was Democrat. But this was as pro-Roosevelt as you could get. They put aside all opposition. But as a cartoonist and a cartoon historian, what I think is brilliant about this is, um, who was this figure? Uncle Sam. Who comes up in a lot of these cartoons. He comes up in a lot of cartoons, but in those days, a lot of cartoonists would put a tag, Uncle Sam, as if we didn't know. And who is this figure? <laughs> it doesn't have a little tag around his ankle saying TR. Everyone knows. But yet he becomes so iconic that all we needed to see was the glasses and the smile. So to me, as a cartoon, this is a brilliant composition. When he comes back, on, I think on June 10th, 1910, the largest ticker tape parade yeah. in the history of New York up till that time, overwhelming public response, welcome back, my boy. Yeah. All right, so uh, and a, we have a bear. A bear. So the, even though this is not Bearman, the bear has now become iconic. Iconic, yeah. And he's bestriding 
Uncle Sam is in Roosevelt's speeches, yeah, his letters, his States. notes. Uh, he's, yeah. he's come back ready to roar. Yeah. It's a brilliantly conceived cartoon. And look at the beautiful way that Harper's Weekly folded the masthead and the, yeah. and the, and the other language here, Rick, into the, into the cartoon. Yeah, it's brilliant. How, how, how tall would this cartoon have been? 16 inches. Does this do full justice to it if you saw it in its original? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And it was, this was the front cover of the magazine that week, and uh, uh, frankly, more colorful than this, gold. And, uh, so an essentially opposition weekly newspaper is welcoming him back in this, in this extraordinary way. Yeah, and not, an, not a hint of opposition. I mean, the eagle is, you know, doesn't show a sore loser de Democrat donkey down here or anything, no, it's... Uh, but Roosevelt is shooting. Or something, the gun has gone off. The gun's gone off, but that's... He just can't stop. Why not? How about this one? Now, this is my number 10. Uh, Roosevelt, so Roosevelt in 1905 issued the Roosevelt Corollary. Mm -hmm. And the Roosevelt Corollary is a, is a corollary to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. The Monroe Doctrine says the Western Hemisphere is off limits to recolonization and meddling by European powers. Roosevelt... Um, really from an earlier time, but especially as president said, well, if, we can't, if we're not going to let Europeans come in and uh, spank Central and South American countries that are misbehaving, that are not paying their bills, that are um, confiscating ships and so on, if, we, if we're refusing to let them come in and, and, and get justice, then we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to take on the responsibility of policing Central and South America when those countries misbehave. So he became sort of the constable of the world. And this cartoon could not be made today. This would be regarded as extremely insensitive. But these are um, people from less developed countries who are coming to Roosevelt, the policemen, to sort out their troubles. Mm -hmm. uh, and the big stick is looming large over these indigenous and, and second and third world peoples. Uh, he's bestriding the entire American continent. And on this side, we have the European powers yeah. who are appealing to him. They're more civilized. You see the primitive nature of, of, of the less advanced peoples. These more civilized Europeans are coming to Roosevelt to arbitrate their disputes. And Roosevelt, as you see, is quite happy to take on this role as the supreme arbiter and policeman of the world. It's a magnificently um, colorful cartoon. Um, tell me the cartoonist. Louis Dalrymple. That's uh, it, Dalrymple. Yes, the Puck. And what, and what do you know about him? Puck magazine. He died of syphilis a year after this. <laughs> what do you know about him that helps this discussion? <laughs> um, that's about it. He started working for that's Puck in it. 1887, and he, he died in 1905. How wide is this cartoon? This is double truck, right? Double truck. So that's cent a 16, 20 inches. Cent center spread of the magazine, mm -hmm. yeah. That's and what, do you like this cartoon? I like it. I never liked him as a stylist, but he, he was a workman. He was a, a workman cartoonist. Um, what I think is clever about this, and all cartoons, frankly, is that what you took several minutes to explain about the background and the explanation is what's brilliant about cartoons. Don't need a few paragraphs to explain it. It's all there. Another, cartoons are all about iconography. If it's Uncle Sam, but you know, a hundred tools at the cartoonist um, use to to make points. Here we are. He is saying, without saying it, that Roosevelt. And you notice more than any other. You won't notice it, but more than any other president, even though Uncle Sam wasn't sent packing, uh, Roosevelt became the symbol of the United States. Even during FDR's time, other presidents, strong presidents' time, very often cartoonists would show Uncle Sam as promoting the administration policy. Roosevelt, maybe because he was too fun to draw. However, so here he is, not Uncle Sam, but Roosevelt as the policeman of the world. That phrase has gone into our language. And then also, even though it's not here, Roosevelt had used it in speeches, but the police nightstick was really the big stick policy. Speak so softly and carry those a big labels, stick. Pardon me? Speak softly and carry a big stick. You That's would go right. far. That's right. So let's go back to this one for a moment. Look at that face. 
and now this face. So this is supreme self-confidence. Great point, that's right. This is just, I mean, he's more serene here, but it's supreme confidence, but this is a, an aggressive gesture. He's yep. not wielding the big stick, but it's handy. Mm -hmm. And notice that it goes to the third world uh, and not uh, to the more advanced world on, on this side of the cartoon. It's a really extraordinary, you know, that age of cartoons is over. You would never see a cartoon like this today, would you, that was a double truck in a huge magazine? Not unless you were on the verge of dying of syphilis. Wow. <laughs> Let it go, Rick. All right. Uh, so this is you. Uh, tell us about this cartoon. Thank you. Also Puck Magazine, Grant Hamilton was the cartoonist who had been art editor of the Republican counterpart, Judge Magazine, years before this, and then years after this. But 1904, I guess he didn't like Roosevelt so much, he went over to the opposition. But here's another cartoon, and um, now you can't all see it very closely, but, um, okay, show of hands. How many, thinks, how many think the cartoon is portraying Roosevelt as the angel of peace? and benefit to world harmony, giving up a militarist past. Okay, well, that's what you're supposed to think first. He's coming as a butterfly out of a chrysalis of the uh, Rough Rider outfit. As usual. As usual, gauntlets and the, um, and this is right after he intervened in the Russo-Japanese War, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize. So he's coming up as an angel of peace, peace conference, and he looks very beneficent. However, the caption, which I chose not to scan in order to surprise you all. Died of syphilis? Was, what's that? No, no, go ahead. Um, was too good to be true. So he's trying to rise above his militarism here, to be a man of international peace. But the cartoonist is saying by that caption, don't believe it. And look at these hands. Yeah, just They're these gnarled, distorted hands. What's that about? That he completely emptied that persona. And his boots, backwards. I think, are on backwards, are they? Not? Yep, yeah. yep, which all is, collapsed. Which is uh, odd. Yeah. What do we have here? That's the uh, White House. That's the White House? Yeah. Interesting cartoon, so... But it's all about the caption, too good to be true. In other words, he's saying... Don't believe it, folks. He's still a This is my number nine, um, called Goal. This is uh, 1908. Roosevelt is, has handpicked his successor, William Howard Taft. Everyone knows that Taft was a huge man. He weighed more than 300 pounds at some points in his life. He got stuck in the bathtub. One of the greatest Taft stories is he was the proconsul. He was our number one person in the Philippines. And, uh, and he was doing a great job for the Roosevelt administration, and Elihu Root was our Secretary of War, and he was a very sarcastic fellow. And Taft wrote a telegram from the Philippines to the Secretary of War saying things are going well. Today I had a 20-mile horse ride. I've never felt better. <laughs> and Elihu Root sent a telegram back, said, how's the horse? <laughs> uh, so, so everyone knows that Taft is fat. And so Roosevelt here, this is basketball had only been born about 15 years before this. Yeah, right. Nate Smith in Springfield, Massachusetts. And if you know much about this, and there's a, there's a cartoon description of this out in the hall, at first these were actually fruit baskets. And so you threw the ball up, and if it happened to go in the basket, then they had to stop the game, and someone had to climb up a ladder and take the ball out of the basket. It was, it was a very gentlemanly game at that point. And so, so that was iteration number one. Then they thought, well, let's, let's do a net rather than a fruit basket. But you see they still had an enclosed bottom, so you still had to climb up and take it down. Yeah. So, so we're having a little sort of cult, pop culture history here about this, this new game. You can imagine that Roosevelt would have regarded basketball as a sissy sport. But here he is trying to throw Taft into the goal. But look how hard... <laughs> How, how strained poor exactly. Roosevelt is in trying to do this. It's, it's everything he can do, and exactly. it looks like yeah. it's going to miss. Yeah. I mean, it's like he's throwing a medicine ball, not a basketball. And in fact, it was a tough sell. He had to persuade the party. A lot of ambitious uh, would-be candidates to step out of the way and accept Taft. But uh, So Rick, 
Yeah. What I love about this cartoon is its simplicity. Yeah. You know, some of these cartoons have a, a tremendous amount of, of detail, and sure. you really have to give it some study. Labels, yeah. Then you, this is more simple, but this is breathtakingly simple. Yeah. And, that, and the colorfulness of it, the, the obviousness of the point that's being made here makes it a really great cartoon, I think. What's your view? Oh, no, I agree with you. And we were we wondering know. whether that's the BSAC. I assume means Big Stick Athletic Club. We don't know. Or it could be Bullshit Athletic Club, but, <laughs> but it's, not ha it's not a good sign. Let's keep it to dignified things like syphilis, oh, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah great. Um, and Clay was having fun at Taft's expense with the comments about the bathtub and everything, but there was a cartoonist once. Taft had the nickname, which was mildly, okay, anyways, Big, big Bill Taft. Well, he's big, and Bill was like, Teddy, okay, don't call him William Howard, call him Bill. Well, it was a cartoonist, I didn't choose it, but drew a, a cartoon of Taft making a speech from behind. And the caption was still Big Bill Taft, but somehow it came out spelled Big Built Aft. Wow, nice pun. Nice pun. So in this case, Roosevelt strained, handpicked Taft, worked for his nomination, accomplished it, left the country to give Taft a chance, went on a year-long safari in Africa and then a kind of grand tour of Europe. While he was away, he's getting increasingly alarmed letters from yeah. his old cronies and, his, and the, the, the more progressive end of the Republican Party saying Taft is lazy, Taft is a failure, Taft has abandoned the progressive agenda, particularly on conservation questions. So and the irony... And those were letters from Taft himself. <laughs> Taft felt that he was not up to the task for a whole period of time. That's right. So Roosevelt has worked so hard to get Taft the presidency, and he regrets it beginning in 1910 and then breaks with Taft in the, in the bull moose, the, the 1912 campaign. So there's, a, there's an irony that we can take from this cartoon that yes. would not have been known at the time, right? That's right. So before we go on, just want you to step back. You told me a, a, a story last night about how people perceive cartoons and why that's not really fair. And you talked about uh, the former editor of, of Newsweek and the Washington Post, Washington Matt Greenfield. Washington Post, right. Yeah. yeah, I'll just take a moment. But um, from my earliest days, I was interested, obsessed. I had a lot of interest, but I was obsessed by cartoons, and vintage cartoons, and Theodore Roosevelt. So those became my collecting interests and everything. And there were reasons that they coincided. Um, and okay, I became a cartoonist, and you know this was my life. And a lot of people, a lot of relatives, a lot of parents, said that cartoons are silly. What do you, you know, get a real job and you can cartoon as a uh, hobby? Well, when I did become a working cartoonist and a member of the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists, um, we had a convention one year in Washington. Uh, Ford was president, and we all went to the White House and drew him, and it was, it was great. Um, but at our opening breakfast, Meg Greenfield, who was the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, uh, gave a speech, and it started, and the entire speech was like this, saying that you people are wonderful, you make my life in these troubled times happier, the best way to start a day is to open newspapers and see your cartoons and make me chuckle. And she escaped with her life. People were offended. People were offended. Why? Because when you, uh, cartoons can be funny and they need to catch your attention, if need to, but by humor, oftentimes irony. Uh, you're trying to make a point, you're trying to persuade people, you're trying to give the talents that God gave you um, to use, to serve other people, to explain issues, and to be dismissed as mere court jesters. Mere is, entertainment. Mere entertainment is awful. And good cartoonists, listen, what makes a good cartoonist since Thomas Nast onwards, the tweed ring and everything, is that consider what cartoonists have to do. They have to address issues that the general public understands using tools and images that are um, universal, that won't confuse people, and they will buy the paper the next day. Um, 
and work, yes, by the lowest common denominator to be understandable to everyone, but also, as we've shown, work not only on a high level, but many levels. Some complex layering of yeah. meaning, secondary, tertiary meaning. Exactly. Ironies, and we see ironies now looking back that they would not have been able to see then because we know how things turned out. Precisely, and they also served an extra, besides persuading and educating the public, but it also subliminally made the public realize that they had to understand the backgrounds of issues and the foundations of disputes uh, in order to understand the cartoons. No one wanted to be confused by cartoons. And so, so did Meg Greenfield understand that you were upset? You bet she did. Yeah. All right, so here we are. Um, okay, we're going to this round. And by the way, that's why I never apologize about breaking your eardrums, about um, having an interest in cartoons and collecting all I can and explaining and sharing them because I think it's among the highest forms of political and historical communication. So we're voting on round two here. How many like this one best of these four? Okay. How about this one? <laughs> how about this one? And how about this one? So, so I, think, I, I think this one won this round. Do you agree with that, Rick? There you go, yes. Okay. Uh, but there was, it was pretty close. Yeah. This one and, and so my two actually, you know. But who? But but who's counting? You know, uh, you're the professional. Yeah, spent your life at this. Forget what I said about the checks. Yeah. Um, all right. So now this is yours, and here we are. Classical Berryman on steroids. Yeah. Very quickly, Berryman drew the drawing the line in Mississippi cartoon. The famous teddy bear cartoon. And he became so associated with the teddy bear use it as a mascot in the corner of every one of his cartoons, either making comments or whatever, that he was always getting requests to draw the teddy bear. Uh, he did this on Evening Star letterhead for a young girl, more elaborate than most. And in one of the display cases, there is a large crayon drawing that I think he did at a public appearance of the teddy bear putting out uh, a gas lamp at night, but he couldn't escape and didn't want to he would have been completely shrouded in obscurity if he didn't keep the teddy bear alive. Did this one appear in print? No. This was a private gift. That's right. To, to somebody who loved his teddy bear motif. Wrote a letter or a relative or so something. This one has only been published subsequently, found in his papers or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, but certainly, um, he didn't hold back. That what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight bears. That was his meal ticket. This is my number eight. This yeah. is called um, Jack and the Wall Street Giants. Uh, I love this one because here's Roosevelt, uh, the righteous warrior, and he loved that role of being the righteous warrior. Righteousness was one of his very favorite words. Mm -hmm. And you can't see this, but this is J.P. Morgan. Here's uh, Jay Gould. Uh, I think it's Lawson. Uh, that's does it say Gould? It Gould is one Gould. of these That's Jay Gould's son, yeah, that's right. That is Gould there. Um, anyway, this is J.P. Morgan. These are the Wall Street Giants. This is, I think, Trinity Church in Lower Manhattan. This these are Manhattan scenes. It's Wall Street. And so he goes to war against the trusts, against what he called the malefactors of great wealth. Yeah. And this cartoon is a, a, a sign of what he's up against. But we also know that in the... the some cartoons work by analogy, Alice in Wonderland, Gulliver's Travels. Uh, Rick, this one works by the analogy to Jack and the Beanstalk. We know that Jack wins That's against right. the giant. Yeah. And so tell was, us more. This was not an anti-Roosevelt cartoon, even though it was in Puck. It's by Kepler. But it, it's suggesting he was up against it, but it's not ridiculing Roosevelt. In fact, none of them are displayed as beneficent figures. This is John... Uh, D. Rockefeller, so this they're all villains. James J. Hill here, known in North Dakota because of the Great Northern Railroad. Great Northern. So these are right. the, the the richest, most powerful men on Wall Street. Yeah. And Little Jack uh, is taking them all on, and he wins. He right. files the Northern Securities lawsuit in in 1902, uh, early on in his presidency. He wins the case in 1904, which was the first successful Supreme Court decision breaking up. The Northern, this was the Northern Securities uh, Corporation, which was a, 
um, uh, a, a restraint of trade trust about Northwestern railroads. He, does, he goes on to do a few more trust, uh, antitrust lawsuits in the course of his presidency. Taft actually did more. Taft did more. So one of the things I remember from my childhood, Rick, was that you first learned in school about Roosevelt, and you hear, oh, the Roosevelt, the trust buster. Mm -hmm. but that's not really the most characteristic thing to say about him. He, he strategically attacked a few trusts, but he said there are good trusts and bad trusts, and he wanted to target a few to warn the rest. Right, or he, I think he made this statement in a speech in Dickinson here in 86 or something like that. July, he loves big speech. things. I love, like all Americans, I love big things. Big things. So he didn't hate corporations because they were big. He uh, wanted to break them up when he thought they were doing bad in a big way. Um, so he did make that decision, uh, that distinction. And... Um, uh, the fact that Taft filed more than Roosevelt did um, in four years than in Roosevelt's seven years um, is a mere detail, I think, because Roosevelt's, because they were first, but also because they were strategic, were really more effective, I think, than Taft. He was a, he was a shrewder politician yeah. than Taft. So in the, in, if we all remember Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack fights against one giant. Uh, Roosevelt's fighting against a whole tribe of giants here, mm. and he wins. And so this is a, I wouldn't say adulatory, but this gives you a sense of what Roosevelt was up against. Yeah. He, was, he was really the first president in American history who had the, um, the courage to do this. Most presidents up till his time, you know, after Lincoln had essentially been caretakers. Uh, they had accepted the dominance of the liberal capitalist world order. Yep. Uh, they felt that the executive should not meddle in the world of business. They were laissez-faire capitalists, and they certainly felt that Congress should take the lead, if anybody. But Roosevelt changes the nature of executive power. And the Sherman Antitrust Act had been in force since 1891, but it was only Roosevelt filing in 1902 and uh, maintaining the fight till 1904 that really put teeth into it. This is you. Yeah. Uh, tell us about it. This is your number seven. It. Yeah, very simple. This is, is it pro-Roosevelt, is it snarky? A little bit of both. Um, Uncle Sam had to snap to it when Roosevelt, the real boss, uh, wanted Showed things up. done. He was coming back from vacation. It was, uh, this was printed in the late summer, 19... Red carpet. Yeah, as I say. Um, and uh, the guy carrying Roosevelt's bags William Loeb, his private secretary, who often was a press uh, relations guy, and by coincidence, who fired that? Um, was the father of my first boss as a newspaper cartoonist, William Loeb of the Manchester Union Leader. Now, there's a conservative newspaper. A conservative newspaper, yeah. But anyway, uh, so Roosevelt, Kepler, once again, loved drawing Roosevelt's face, whether it was pro or anti. He was a cartoonist who I think would have paid Roosevelt royalties to, uh, if he had to, to, to show his face. But here we are again, like a couple of the other cartoons, just bounding, enthusiastic, vital. And this isn't too far from the truth. Uncle Sam, the country said, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and like, Uncle Sam is a valet to the, the actual boss. That's right, yeah. So this reminds us of, of Roosevelt's general approach when he became police commissioner of New York. He went to Mulberry Street, 300 Mulberry Street. He bounded up the stairs, and he said, what should we do first? What should we do? Let's look around. What's the first thing we can do? And he was more eager to get something started than he really knew what was the right thing to start. Yep. And here you see another example of it. He's, he's, he's wringing his hands with glee that he's back from holiday, and poor Loeb has to bear the burden of his luggage. <laughs> it's a great cartoon. Yeah. Here's my number seven. You can't read this very well. There's a... Um, it's over here if you want to take a look at it. I urge you all to look at, at these cartoons and the descriptions. Uh, Rick wrote some of them, and I wrote some of the rest. This is a White House scene. Roosevelt is looking at George Washington's um, huge painting. Uh, he, of course, he's wearing Rough Rider gear, and here's the big stick. Um, but Roosevelt, is, remember what uh, Light Horse Harry Lee said of Washington after his death, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Roosevelt 
like a child is, is, is carroting in second in war, <laughs> second in peace, second in the hearts of his countrymen, making way for himself as an even greater president than George Washington. And the book, Rick, mm. it says alone in Cuba. It's, <laughs> it's the Peter Finley Dunn satire on Roosevelt's Rough yeah. Riders that the egotism of the man is seen not only in what he's doing to the greatest of all early presidents, one of the top four, but also what he's, the book that says how, how gigantic his ambition and ego are. Exactly. This doesn't show a lot of cartoonists might have of him stepping on the Constitution or trashing the Constitution. Hassman of Puck Magazine didn't happen to do that. But I love the anecdote of Roosevelt trying to convince Senator Spooner of Wisconsin right. to quit the Senate and become his attorney general. And Spooner said, well, you've got two of the most legal, uh, brilliant legal minds in the country already in your cabinet in Taft and Root. Elihu Root. Why do you want me? Why don't you want them to be attorney general? He said, because they don't agree with me all the time. <laughs> huh, sounds familiar. Yeah, um, that's right. And, and notice that TR is, is depicted in miniature almost like a child, like he's yeah. a child trying to be a giant here. I think this is a very meaningful cartoon. It's about legacy, which is the theme of our symposium. And Roosevelt is anticipating a huge legacy, and he has the effrontery to take on, if not the most beloved president in American history, the untouchable yeah. uh, George Washington. And of course, it's like what a child would do, second in war, second in peace, second in the hearts of his countrymen. And the stick is bigger almost than Roosevelt. Yeah. It's a beautiful cartoon. Yeah. Here's your number six. Yeah, I mentioned before that Edith kept a scrapbook of cartoons about Theodore. And every one of Opper's cartoons for Hearst, the series was called Willie and His Papa. And it ran during the campaign, presidential campaign of 1900 and after they won. Stopped only when McKinley was assassinated. But Opper, who drew Happy Hooligan, a lot of comic strips later on with it, great names in American cartooning scored a great hit with this series. The public loved it, so did Edith, and the rumors are that Roosevelt got a chuckle out of it too. But Willie was always a little sissy boy. TR was always in his toy horse and rough rider, like a Halloween costume. Um, and Mark Hanna, McKinley's kingmaker, uh, kingmaker and uh, MNL Sklees, um, was always the nursemaid. And the trusts. Why uh, the trusts? What, what's going on here? Well, uh, you know, we talked about the Antitrust Act in 1891, and the public, both parties, a lot of people of all stripes really thought that trusts and monopolies, we don't call them trusts anymore, but monopolies were really choking America to death. So there was a general term, the trusts. And it was, in fact, that they were business combinations in almost any sphere of life. The ice trust, the tin trust, and controlling prices, choking competition. It was a problem. They knew it in the 1890s, so they passed this act and nothing was done with it. So it took Roosevelt to do it. But what Opper was saying in this series is that the trusts were so powerful that they dominated McKinley as a little boy and... Uh, Roosevelt and the new administration, all that. So that was the theme. The Along trusts the are way, not concerned. The trusts are supremely confident. Oh, that's right. They These guys the, aren't going to make any difference. Ran the show. But along the way, Opper had enormous fun in panel after panel after panel. And these were syndicated around America. There was a reprint book. Um, just having fun uh, showing Roosevelt as the bully boy on the block. I mean, here we are. McKinley and Roosevelt being the vice president. And guess who's doing the painting of the sign? Yep, that's it, exactly. Uh, Roosevelt has painted himself. And uh, in one cartoon, McKin uh, uh, Trusty is asking uh, Willie why he's crying, and it's after the inauguration. And it's Teddy had established a, uh, built a little um, parade of wagons and uh, of course he sat at the front and there was a tiny little stool at the back marked for McKinley. So that was the theme and he had great fun. 
And Roosevelt was big enough that he just thought it was great fun. He didn't McKinley mind McKinley is, is depicted possibly as a woman here. Um, Miss Nancy was a term that was frequently used of men that were not thought to be yeah. uh, manly enough. And so there's, there's a little bit of gender a lot stuff of going on here, yeah, too. Yeah, like a little Lord Fauntleroy or something, yeah. All right, so this is one we both chose. It was my number six, your number four. Uh, amazing how many of these were Uncle Sam. And so one of the things that strikes me is, is, uh, is the country's uncertainty about Roosevelt. So there are other politicians who the country's not particularly uncertain about. They either like them or they don't. They elect them or they don't. But there was a lot of anxiety when Roosevelt was coming up about, what, is he too wild? Is he too much of a maverick? Is he a loose cannon? Hannah called him that damned cowboy. Uh, and there was a sense that maybe Roosevelt is not, has, doesn't have the deportment or the, or the decorum or the dignity to be the right. president of the United States. And so when you get these famous Uncle Sam cartoons, it's the country trying to decide whether Roosevelt is a fitting president of the United States. So tell us, tell us yeah. about the cartoon. Well, this is Davenport again, who had been, did some brilliant anti-Roosevelt cartoons for Hearst. And then he switched to the mail and said, I, I want to support this man. And um, What year would this be? This would, 1904. So he's standing for election. Standing for election, good enough for me. And the back story here, New York Mail. But this was used, and in my book I have, I reprint an actual postcard. It was reproduced as posters on trucks and buildings and in postcards that were mailed out by the millions. So it wasn't just in newspapers. It became a campaign document. And um, it says it all, his point of view, that the nation is behind you, Mr. President. And so questions of his fitness for office or whether he was too wild to be president have now been settled, at least according to Davenport. Got dignified, yeah. It's a great cartoon, one of the most iconic of all Roosevelt cartoons. So where are we here? Let's see. Um, that one we did, right? So this one, how many think this is the best of this group? That, that was pity clapping, I think. <laughs> that, that, was, that was pity clapping, just to keep you in the debate. Uh, how about this one? Hey! Hey! Uh, how about this one? And this one. Can you sense which one? I don't know. What do you think? I think the next one. <laughs> I, no. I, I, I think this one. Um, but it, it was close. This was close. All right. I think this one, we feel deep respect for this, right? I mean, this one really, uh, this is a very important endorsement of Roosevelt. He, you know, he, he became president through the back door. Um, McKinley was assassinated in September of 1901. Roosevelt comes in. Mark Hanna, who didn't like him, who was McKinley's friend and kingmaker, said, now look what you've done, that damned cowboy is the president of the United States. He became the damned cowboy out here. Um, there was a lot of, Roosevelt wanted to be reelected in the worst way. Uh, this was the most important moment of his political career. He wanted, didn't want to be an asterisk. He wanted to be elected in his own right. He was, overwhelmingly. Didn't want to be an accident. And here you have the country saying, he's okay. This is a good president. All right, so this one, this is your five. Yeah, um, in 1916, after the Bull Moose campaign where Roosevelt was third party candidate, came in second, uh, was out of office, and we talked before, was unpopular for a while and came back during the war. Robert Carter, who drew for the World the Journal, The Sun, two Philadelphia newspapers, also a hired gun would draw anti-Roosevelt cartoons or pro. Well, this is vaguely pro. And he took, I think, took um, Davenport's cartoon and turned it around, a Roosevelt endorsing Uncle Sam, not for election, but when talk about war and peace and the unsettled, uh, the issue of preparedness and such. Um, he's loyal. He's loyal. And Roosevelt had, uh, uh, Carter had a great way of drawing Uncle Sam as a, ferocious uh, stern. character, stern, honest, grabbing the flag. And he's, in effect, saying, if you support the flag and Uncle Sam, you'll like Roosevelt's for supporting the flag and Uncle Sam. And this, this caption was, 
he's good enough for all. So that's quoting wow. Roosevelt in effect. So after Roosevelt leaves office voluntarily in March of 1909, yep. the question is, what do you do with so gigantic a persona and a political figure for the rest of his life? And uh, former presidents often have a hard time adjusting to that. Roosevelt probably more than any other yeah. former president. You're going to be talking a little bit about that tomorrow. So when it became clear that there was going to be a world war, Roosevelt wanted us to be prepared. Um, uh, he knew we were going to have to get in. He thought that Wilson was mishandling this every possible way. And so for Roosevelt to be seen as loyally putting his hand of confidence on Uncle Sam, who is resolute in what's coming in the world arena, is a sign that Roosevelt is not as dangerous and irresponsible as some people are thinking that he is, right? And certainly determined. Once again, no cartoon iconography, no labels. We really don't need them. But pro or anti, nothing caricatured about that face. But determined. De determined. So here's my number five. I love this cartoon. Yeah. This is Roosevelt in Panama. And of course, he later said, I took Panama. And, and he boasted about all this in a way that actually uh, concerned some of his loyal friends. Uh, this one dates to 1903. So it's a long backstory. Roosevelt felt we must have an Isthmian Canal. There was a debate between whether to make a sea level canal at Nicaragua or a, a lock and dam canal in Panama. Panama, as you know, won. Roosevelt then uh, tried to work with the nation of Colombia. Panama was, a, was the northern neck of Colombia at the time. And we were prepared to, to give Colombia $10 million um, as a sort of a, um, fee, including a leasing fee, to, to put the Panama Canal in its northern neck in its Panama territory. The Colombian Senate, uh, after the treaty had already been um, um, written by uh, Secretary of State John Hay, the Colombian Senate said, no, that's not a good deal. We don't, we're not just going to roll over for these Yankees. And so Roosevelt, at that time, threw fell into a terrible fit of righteousness and anger. And he said, we're just going to do it. And so just at that time, coincidentally enough, Panama rebelled against the nation of Colombia. We recognized it on the same day. Um, there was a lot of haste, and, and Roosevelt was considered to have behaved in a high-handed, uh, to put it lightly, way, um, and became very defensive about this for a long time. But what makes this cartoon so pleasant is, again, Roosevelt is a giant amongst people who aren't. All these ships are waiting. Mm -hmm. The world's ships are waiting to go through the, the isthmus. Mm -hmm. And so Roosevelt's the one who's going to dig this thing because nobody else, the French, weren't able to do it. But the part that I love is that he's throwing the dirt on Bogota, <laughs> on the capital of Colombia. So he's not only getting the canal done, but he's punishing what he called those jackrabbits mm -hmm. uh, in the Colombian Senate for not cooperating with his plan. Tell us more. Well, not much more to tell, but I mean, for years when I was younger and I would see this reproduced small in books, I considered it a pro Roosevelt cartoon. He's looking resolute. And he's then taking you see the this. Bull by the, yeah, it was hard to notice that reproduced small in books, but it looks like he's getting done what the Lesseps and others couldn't do. Um, a new treaty, yeah, I suppose so. Well, it turns out that there was a treaty that they were trying to blackmail us and everything. But when you see this, you realize that this is more critical of Roosevelt than, uh, or at least depicting two sides of the issue. And Roosevelt said this is one of the wonders of the world. No nation should be able to hold this up. This is something that belongs to the whole planet, and I'm going to make sure that we can, can, we, we can cut this, this uh, canal between the, at the narrowest neck of, 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 of the Western Hemisphere. This is uh, my number six, your number, wait, wrong way. Um, What's happened here? Maybe we. I think we're repeating. Chose it twice. That's um, all right. The dinner that's all right. I had, dinner I had last night is still repeating. So. Wow. <coughs> um, so here's my number four. <laughs> one of the most one of the, the most delightful cartoons. This is oh, sorry. This is poor Taft coming into the East Room for the first time, and Roosevelt has departed, but his uh, his accoutrements are not yet gone. Okay. So look at all the quadrupeds that he's killed and that are lining the floor. But it even gets better if you, this is not a very good reproduction of it, but you see the andirons are Roosevelt and the lamps are Roosevelt. The moose head. Yeah, the moose head. And look, be, to, 
the, the cartoonist is brilliant. To take a little of the edge off of the slaughter, he has smiling dead animals. <laughs> They're all kind of cheerfully Roosevelt's trophies. The whole room is filled with trophies in every direction. This is, look, this is a bull moose Roosevelt, even though it's an elk. All of the images, these are Roosevelt, these are Roosevelt, Roosevelt on the back of the chair. It's yeah. Roosevelt's White House is the point. Yeah. Uh, the the decorations. The chandeliers yeah. filled with Roosevelt's. Yeah. We get the point, right? That would be a contest. Give people mic uh, magnifying glasses and count the Roosevelt faces. It's it, brilliant. Isn't this great? Who did this? Yeah. Uh, also, uh, uh, Has uh, Charles Hassman. Of so Puck. Hassman is, is a genius. Yeah, and only drew for Puck for a couple of years. I don't know anything about him before or afterwards, but when he worked, it was great. So Roosevelt leads the country to go on safari to give Taft a chance to establish his own administration. Taft innocently walks into the room. Look at his horror. You're never getting rid of Roosevelt. It's Roosevelt's White House now for the duration. <laughs> this is your number three. Tell us. Yeah, this is a, this is a story about back, a back story. Um, in 1886, the young Roosevelt lost the mayor's race in New York City came in third. Uh, the winner was De Democrat Abram Hewitt, who was Peter Cooper's nephew, and in, uh, an industrialist, and was an investor in cattle ranches out here. Hewitt was, his, Hewitt his was. opponent, who won. Yeah, who never showed up in a saddle, but that's lost the history. But, and the number two candidate was Henry George, the socialist, and the establishment was so afraid of socialism in 1886 that they abandoned Roosevelt, Republicans abandoned. So he came in a distant third. Well, at that point, Roosevelt thought his life as a politician is over. He had left the Badlands. He thought he'd be a historian and an author the rest of his life. So he wasn't involved in Republican politics. I mean, in 1889, he became civil service commissioner. But here's a cartoon a year later, uh, 1887, showing a very young Theodore Roosevelt, 87, he would have been uh, 26 or 20, seven, yeah. yeah. Um, and yet, the grandees of the Republican Party, here's Allison Everts of New York, John Sherman of Ohio, anti um, Chauncey Depew, uh, his friend and ally, uh, young Henry Cabot Lodge, et cetera, et cetera, and James Blaine, who had run for president, all of them anointing the young Roosevelt Little Roosevelt, the grand old party must be hard up. And look at this expression, kind of, he doesn't care. He's a little bit like, oh, I deserve this. Hurry up, guys. Armor with a pot belly, which is funny. Um, so the editorial in this issue uh, was savagely anti-Roosevelt. And it said, it concluded, dream on. Mr. Roosevelt, dream while you may. You are not the timber of which presidents are made. Trying to short circuit this before it gets out of hand. Exactly. So it's not even they were anointing him to be a senator or anything like that. It's putting down presidential uh, ambitions before he was 30. So I told Clay, my guess for this is that the editor of Puck did not like Roosevelt personally. They were in the same literary circle. But there are letters whenever Bunner, H.C. Bunner, was invited to a dinner. He would ask, is Roosevelt going to be there? He just didn't like him. So my guess is that he either heard or he was at a dinner suffering through a display of Roosevelt's ego, perhaps, perhaps, speculating himself that he might be president someday which would be very interesting if it's true. We don't have it in letters, but we know it must have been in his mind. You think that an event precipitated the editorial? I do. It was so ad hominem otherwise, so abstract, that it must have been that. This feels a little busy to us, but these people, remember, everyone in his time would have known each of these people by face exactly. and reputation. So this would be like seeing Al Gore and, and like seeing Nancy Pelosi and like seeing John Boehner and like seeing... Paul Ryan, That's all right. these yep. recognizable figures are in the cartoon. Which speaks to the skill of cartoonists in those days. They just didn't make a composition that was handsome or worked, but they had to know. And all these cartoons in Puck and Judge magazine were lithographs drawn on 
stone backwards, and the stone lithographs were turned into so very printing complex plates. Yeah, technology. Uh, grease crayon, then acid was put on that would become the printing plate in stone. So every letter had to be backwards and everything, and then a different stone for every color. So these guys were amazing. So Rick, we're running out of time, I'm and sorry. Sharon's going to appear any second. So just one thing: there's a, there's a certain ambiguity in the. Uh, person who's going to knight, this looks like a menacing moment, too. The party's not quite sure here what to do with this knight No, I don't think era. so. You don't think so? All right. I think they're just... Uh, this is my number three. Yeah. Uh, this is a Berlin cartoon by Andrew Johnson. Uh, Arnold Johnson. Arnold Johnson. Yeah. Um, this is during his presidency. Um, I think this captures Roosevelt's pugnacious um, style, if you see him. Um, in, in photographs or even in the film clips we have, he's constantly beating one fist with the other. Yeah. He leans out over every um, fence or every podium that he's on. He's so far ahead of, of himself that, that he's leaning over the flag. He's almost leaning out of the print. Um, it's a brilliant caricature. Tell it just, we don't have much time, but say something about caricature. Well, a caricature is to exaggerate. And it's sometimes to be flattering, most of the time not. Uh, and he could have drawn Roosevelt anyway, but it's part of the cartoonist's arsenal that it's just not making teeth bigger or, um, you know, the eyes, with the eyeglasses there are shiny in some cartoons. It's what we see here and why you like it, the whole attitude and what's implied by the attitude and also, I think that's one thing that's dispositive in this cartoon, once again, is the caption. It's not Theodore Roosevelt speaking. It's president. I, I think that's a little sarcastic. Like, he, you believe this someone guy's the president? acts like this yeah. is the president of the United States? I think. And there were many European cartoonists who pictured Roosevelt that way. He looks a little berserk. You know, this is, this yeah. is a very, very strong aggression and dangerous. It feels a little dangerous. He's a dangerous man, and he's going to punch his way out right out of his own cartoon. That's how wild he is. It's a brilliant evocation of one aspect of the Roosevelt yeah. character. Here's your uh, number two. We're just about finished. Yeah. Go ahead. Go quickly. It's the 1884 presidential campaign. James Blaine, the ultimate, uh, ultimately was the nominee, and uh, Bernard Gillum of Puck Magazine. Uh, decided, to, this is based on a popular French print, but pictured Blaine stripped to the waist with all his political sins and scandals. He was a very controversial figure, corrupt. Very controversial, really corrupt. Uh, even as Speaker of the House and letters had survived where he openly solicited bribes and such. But all the sins were his tattoos on him. And the thing that makes it interesting in the Roosevelt context is, okay, that the... the uh, Convention's about to take place. These are all the gray beards of the Republican Party. This is Whitelaw Reed, who was editor of the New York Tribune, the unofficial Republican paper. But look, you see bald heads and gray beards, old figures. This Logan, who became the vice presidential candidate, Sherman, again, of the Antitrust Act. Edmund of Vermont, who Roosevelt supported. Supported and lost. Um, George William Curtis, editor of Harper's Weekly. And then a figure who's 25 years old. Filled and with that, consternation. Filled with consternation, thinking, contemplating, not mocking, not... Uh, and Roosevelt, his wife and mother had died. Um, he decided to come out here. Um, but right after they died, he went head over heels back into work, maniacal work in the New York Assembly, buried himself in work, went to the Republican Convention, and he and Lodge single-handedly, as guys in their 20s, succeeded in making Lynch of Mississippi, a black congressman, chairman of the convention. I mean, it was Herculean work. And then worked on behalf of George Edmonds as the reform candidate. It didn't work. But Roosevelt, as I say, in his mid-20s, became a national political figure, and cartoons cemented that, acknowledged it and cemented it, and there he is. Just a couple quick things about this, Rick. Mm -hmm. Brilliant cartoon. Again, everyone would have known every face. 
Roosevelt thought that this was the end of his political career, that he had, because yeah. he, he didn't support Blaine, Blaine won, uh, but he wouldn't break with the Republican Party with the mugwumps, and so he thought that he was persona non grata, and, the, and, and that was the end of that. Both sides. But the historical it. analogy here is to the old Roman Senate. These are meant to be like the Roman senators, and when somebody stood for high office in Rome, um, they would strip in front of the Senate and show their scars from the wars that they had been in. And so the irony here is that when he strips, it's just scandal, corruption, bribery. There are no scars. It's just his own corruption. So and it's, it's a, a brilliant cartoon. I identified some faces. They're not labeled. The public was expected to recognize them. Tough job for a cartoonist. Blaine is not labeled, but even from one half of his face, you know who he was. It was a great cartoon as a cartoon. Here's my number two. Here's Roosevelt camping. <laughs> it's a great camping cartoon. It's simple. I love that. Here are all his companions. He's worn them all out. <laughs> he hiked too far. They're all just comatose. He's up early drinking his coffee, and he's ready to go. And the caption is, I wish the boys would get up. Uh, here I have had breakfast ready an hour. And so this captures that extraordinary spirit of Theodore Roosevelt, um, the gumption, the indefatigable energy, the youthfulness, the restlessness, the love of the camping life. It's a brilliantly drawn cartoon. Tell us about him. John McCutcheon of the Chicago Tribune was called the Dean of American Cartooning. He was a friend of Roosevelt and drew a lot of memorable uh, cartoons about Roosevelt through the years, many of which were variations on a theme like 8, 10, 12 panels of a normal day in the president's life. And he'd show him boxing and swimming and rowing and all this business. And then the last panel would be, and then he's ready for breakfast. Right. <laughs> So he got a lot of mileage out so of that. So he's great at this, and those ones that have him doing 100 things in a single day, are some of that's them are it. at, are at uh, the birthplace. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but notice that his companion's shoes are all scuffed up and worn out. Uh, they just can't keep up with Roosevelt. And he's just bored to tears because he's a man of action and certainly doesn't ever want to be sitting alone. Look at these two sleeping in a tent. It's a, it's a great cartoon. Yeah. Here's your number one. Uh, tell us why. Roosevelt himself said this was his favorite cartoon. In the autobiography, right? In his autobiography. Drawn by Everett Lowry, who did early comic strips, uh, Binnacle Jim and strips like that. Um, but uh, the caption of the cartoon is his favorite author. Who, who happens and, to be? And who happens to be? Roosevelt. The president, and there's Roosevelt's portrait up there. And what Roosevelt said in a couple paragraphs in his autobiography is he said, he would want to be remembered by this cartoon because he said the man reading my message is the typical old farmer written about, and he named a couple books, um, plain, simple, hardworking, his feet up to the fire at the end of the day, and not with great um, absurd ambitions, but just wanting me to do what I should do for him. And Roosevelt had pretty good taste, that says it all. Well, that, that his love of the, of the common man and yeah. the support of the average American that felt that he might be a patrician, but he was on their side and he was fighting for their cause. Exactly. But the only thing I disagree with about this, I love this cartoon too, but I would have rather had this be one of his books <laughs> because he, he took himself very seriously as a man of letters and as an author. He did. And he's maybe the greatest writer amongst all the presidents. If, yeah. if, you, if you look at the whole body of work, this is... Uh, his presidential message, his first presidential message was 20,000 words long. It took the House of Representatives four and a half hours to read it. Uh, he didn't go up to read it in person, but it was almost interminably long. And none of his one of his messages never used the first person pronoun for this egotist. Never said I. But about whether it should be a book or not, and by the way, Ruddy wrote a great book, came out a few years ago, Theodore Roosevelt's America, which is a scrapbook of passages about American history from all of Roosevelt's books, reading as one text, and it's brilliant. Um, but this was probably done for a newspaper on, on a deadline. After one of the messages. The day after one of the messages was delivered. Oh, so I timely. think that's the context, yeah. All right, here's my number one, um, my all-time favorite Roosevelt cartoon, although that we left out hundreds that we could have nominated yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, this is, um, of course, Roosevelt. Um, in Rough Rider costume, which he was depicted in essentially half the time for the rest of his easily, life. Almost easily. every other cartoon, no matter where he is and at what stage in his life is, is cowboy or rough rider, and they're related.
But what's so interesting is that he's, look at, he's casting his shadow right up to the portico of the White House. And here we have McKinley and Hannah and others of the establishment. Speaker Reed. Speaker Thomas Reed. Mm -hmm. They're peering out of the Capitol, five of them, scowling, nervous, because this is an unstoppable shadow being cast over Pennsylvania Avenue and the ellipse. What makes this such a great and fascinating cartoon for me, Rick, is that the year that this was done was before, it's 1898, right after the Rough Rider campaign in Cuba, and before he is even the governor of New York. He's not even governor of New York yet, and everyone gets it, uh-oh. The cartoonist was predicting. This guy is going to be the yeah. president of the United States, and yeah. this, this guy whose who's highest office so far uh, was to be an assemblyman in the New York State Legislature, failed as a candidate for the uh, mayor of New York, um, is suddenly rocketed towards the governorship because of the fame of the Cuba campaign. Uh, they see him already as um, a person who is going to alter everything and his shadow before even being elected to the governorship of the most populous and powerful state um, has already reached the portico and is soon going to go much farther. This is what cartoons do and can do. I mean, it's the whole story. It's cartoonist as prophet. Uh, it's everything. It's, All uh, right, so now we have to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, before we do, before we vote, first, a thousand thanks to you, Rick Marshall, our cartoon <laughs> expert. Uh, Thank you. You'll be signing books in the lobby. Tomorrow you're giving another lecture on the Great War. Uh, Roosevelt in, in his post-presidential years. Am I? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, you, have a, you, have some, you have some time to prepare. <laughs> um, so let's go back. So we're going to start from the beginning here. So now this is not going to be fun or easy, uh, but that's the nature of our day. All right, so remember, you're... You're going to vote for one of these more than any other. And I suppose we should allow Sharon to have her moment here. Uh, Sharon's cartoon. How many think that's the best of them? And Sharon is clapping. All right. Um, <laughs> how about this one? Not a single hand, Rick. Um, <laughs> how about this one? Three hands. All right. This one. Uh, a smattering of applause. This one. Nobody. All right. Um, welcome home, my boy. A few hands. The constable and the world's policeman. Uh, we're just tired now. Um, this is a fickle Roosevelt, Roosevelt trying to rise above his jingoism. That's a fickle group, isn't it? Oh, boy. You know, <laughs> after syphilis, it's been downhill. <laughs> uh, how about Roosevelt basketball player? Uh, the, this is not a cartoon, but this, uh, this special gift to the young woman. Uh, Roosevelt the Giant Killer. So far, I think that's the highest. I think so. Uh, Roosevelt uh, taking, uh, making Uncle Sam his valet. Uh, Roosevelt um, cartooning out George Washington. Uh, this, uh, the trusts are unconcerned. You know, I don't even know if you want to talk tomorrow after this. You know? <laughs> it's been such a humiliation for you. Um, he's, all, he's okay by me. Uh, he's okay by me for the world. Uh, Roosevelt digging the Panama Canal himself. Uh, yeah, uh, Roosevelt. <laughs> so far. And, and here's why. It's not the most important or the most meaningful or the most, um, um, that it doesn't say the most about his legacy as, as a major figure. In a way it does. He was but in his national life. He purely never, delightful. Yeah, yeah, his, yeah. The way he dominated. And, and here you have the mastery of the cartoonist. Instead yeah. of just having a bunch of stuff and trophies, yeah. the smiling bears and yeah. the, the andirons with Roosevelt. It's a piece of genius, even though it may not be the most significant of the cartoons. This uh, one about Roosevelt being girded up as a, as a knight errant. Uh, Roosevelt the berserk American. Uh, Blaine's corruption. Uh, Roosevelt camping. 
Uh, the average American farmer loving Roosevelt. TR is counting on you, you know, for this one. And then the shadow of Roosevelt. <laughs> Sharon, only, only you can settle this. What, wh who won? Uh, what won, not who won? We know who won, but what won? Who didn't lose? What, what do you think, Sharon? What, which was the top? Uh, the one before this that, that got the most votes. Back, back, back. There. Yeah. I, think, I think that was it, so, don't you? And I, I and think, I think yeah. Roosevelt won. That's the point. It has the most Roosevelts. <laughs> but but uh, one more thing about this, Sharon. This is a poor reproduction of an absolutely magnificent, this is low yeah. resolution. Go home and Google this. Yeah. Uh, this is really a stunning piece of work, and it sums up so many Roosevelt themes. Take us out. Better than Googling it, go to our website and you'll be able to find <laughs> it. <laughs> so um, let's just again thank our wonderful so. um, interpreters this evening. So we're going to give Rick and Clay the opportunity to exit the auditorium first so they can get out there and be ready to sign books for us. Um, uh, and please take advantage of that uh, opportunity here. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the symposium sessions today and tomorrow are being live streamed. So if you know someone you think might enjoy this, please share with them uh, dickinsonstate.edu slash tr. And uh, it's just a YouTube live stream. There's no login. We, it's a new system we're using this year, and it's working very well for those at a distance. Again, I'll give a quick shout out to John Olson in Iowa, who I know is watching us, and I know there are a couple others as well. So um, share it and, and, and invite others to join in with us. I want to draw to your attention. Do you need to say something before will, you go? I'll wait for you. I know, but we need to get you up front. OK, okay? let me just say this. Um, if you're interested in, in, in working on this survey for my North Dakota book, I have them outside. All right. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, let's have you go out, out front, Rick. Um, so while you're here, uh, we have three special exhibits that are only available this weekend. The first is, as Clay said, around the auditorium. Rick and Clay have written the interpretation uh, cards related to these items, um, both cartoons and other images related to Roosevelt and his legacy. Um, so take the opportunity to get in closer. Some of them are the cartoons they shared this evening, but there's a lot of other material there as well. Um, even more importantly, uh, Rick Marshall has brought uh, original artifacts, original drawings of cartoons, um, and other pieces that are part of his collection, and he's allowing us to exhibit those. They're just outside this auditorium, in between the two uh, doors. And thanks to our friend Melanie Vidado, those were mounted today, <laughs> and they're only up for you, the participants in this symposium, over the next couple of days. So do take the chance to see some of those original pieces that Rick has shared with us. Um, also, uh, the Friendship Tower in uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, celebrated its 100th anniversary this year. We're happy to have with us Cindy uh, Panora Seglian, who was part of creating some exhibits around that celebration and, and was a, a real uh, driver, uh, one of the drivers in their community to celebrate that anniversary. And they um, reached out to us for some materials to tell that story. And so we had played some small part in it, and they've allowed us to exhibit the panels um, from that. There are eight exhibit panels that tell the story of the relationship between Theodore Roosevelt and Seth Bullock, who is the driving force be be, uh, behind the establishment of Friendship Tower. Um, so those are displayed beginning outside the auditorium here. We have room for just two out front. And so you start here, they do tell us a consecutive story and there are eight. So you start here and you go down this hallway and they go all the way over to Stockson Library <laughs> where, where the Theodore Roosevelt Cent Center offices are located. So as you're going out of the auditorium and then going to the left uh, and just, um, again, we, we, these have been on exhibit at Mount Rushmore 
and we borrowed them just for the weekend <laughs> to have them here for you. So please take advantage of that while you're here. And uh, lastly, particularly for our student participants, if this is the only session of the symposium we're able to, to attend, we do ask that you fill out an evaluation that is also available at the website, dickinsonstate.edu slash TR. Um, for our student participants. We'll, we may reach out through your professors and, and share that with you as well. Um, but for the rest of you, it is available in your program books. And if you'll sort of take mental notes as you go for if this is, you know, if you're with us for the duration, of course. Um, but if this is the only session you're here for, some of our guests from the local community dropping in this evening, please um, do fill out that evaluation about this event uh, because it helps us to improve our programming for the future. Uh, thank you so much. We'll convene here again at 9 a.m. tomorrow. There will be Continental Breakfast beginning at 8 a.m. So we look forward to seeing you in the morning. I uh, hope you'll stop and see Clay and Rick and uh, get, your, get their books and get them signed before you go this evening. Thank you. <laughs>